Back us up just a page or so from where we left off <clears throat> on the other day. Um, I want to go back and re-examine, because I, I went over it a little bit too quickly, the scene where Parson Hooper talks with his fiance. And this is um, 394 and 395. She comes in, she looks at him, says, you know, there's nothing um, odd or terrible, Adam, um, odd or terrible about this cloth over your face. It's just a piece of crepe. And she says, let the sun shine from behind the cloud. Second paragraph from 394. First lay aside your black veil, then tell me why you put it on. His smile glimmers faintly. What is something doing when it glimmers? What is a light doing when it glimmers? Is it shining? No. It's just barely flickering, okay? So it's not a bright light. In other words, there's, there's like a recognition on his face that his smile is, is giving out, okay? And he says, there is an hour to come when all of us shall cast aside our veils. Take it not amiss, beloved friend, if I wear this piece of crepe till then. Your words are a mystery too, she says. Take away the veil from them, or for them, at least. Okay, so if you can't take the veil off your face, at least, she says, remove the veil from your words. Just as the veil hides his face, his words, she is saying, hides his meaning. In other words, you're not being open, you're not being direct with me. Speak openly and honestly. And he says... I will, as far as my vow may suffer me. We have no idea what his vow is. We, we don't know what his vow is when we reach the conclusion of the story. We're never told what vow he took. Okay? But what is a vow? To God. To God? You have marriage vows? What's a, what is involved in a marriage vow? It's a promise, right? It's a promise you make to the other person, okay? So he says, the veil is a type and a symbol. And we've talked about those words, and I put this up here. It's a type and a symbol, because the other day when I talked about a type, I used a word that I shouldn't have used. I said, you know, that in the Old Testament there are prefigurings. And I use that prefiguring as a synonym for type. It's not, okay? So... Take that idea of prefiguring out. What is a type? It's an image of something that, in its first use, is kind of incomplete and points to its completion or, or fulfillment. And so I give three examples here. Moses, Samson, David. They are all, in the Old Testament, types of Christ. How? Because they're not perfect, okay, or complete fulfillments of what, according to traditional Christian theology, Christ does in the New Testament, okay? Christ is the perfection, let's say, of Moses, because Moses more or less leads his people out of the promised land. What's, where, where does... This, as type, as image, as analog, break down. How is it not complete? What happens to all the people who leave Egypt, if you know the biblical story? And for 40 years, they die. First generation dies in the wilderness. It's the second generation that then goes on into the promised land. 
That's how it kind of, each one of these, they're incomplete. They're not perfect. This is the completion, the perfection. Samson, obviously. The whole marriage with Delilah and everything. Okay? The whole telling Delilah about his strength is in his hair. He gets his hair cut off, loses it, gets his eyes put out. Temple of Dagon, he crushes the gods, just like Christ does. But again, fallen, David, Bathsheba. That's it. Okay? So he says, this thing is a type and a symbol. That is, it's pointing to something. Okay. Question is, what is it pointing to? It is a type and a symbol, and I'm bound to wear it ever, both in light and darkness, solitude, and before the gaze of multitudes. As with strangers, so with my familiar friends. So he wears this where? And when? Everywhere, 24-7. He sleeps with it. He bathes with it on. He's never without it. Okay, so this should help us maybe formulate some kind of ideas about what it is. Because why in the world would he wear it when he's totally by himself? I mean, obviously it's symbolic for other people, correct? Yeah, but it's also symbolic for him. Again, it's a blackened piece of cloth so that when he looks out through it, even on a bright sunny day like today, or in a brightly lit room like this, what happens to his perspective of everything? It's darkened. How many of you are familiar? I used to be able to ask this 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and most people would be somewhat familiar, but times are changing. How many of you are familiar with, um, and I can't remember which book, See the first or second Corinthians where Paul is talking about the resurrection. He says, now we see, but know how it goes? But through a glass darkly. Through a glass doesn't mean a glass like those windows, but those windows are a good example. Because if you look at them, you can see what on them? Stain, crap, film. They're not clean like I just cleaned my glasses before I came in here. Okay? When he says, now we see but through a glass darkly, he's talking about these kinds of things. They didn't know how to make them in Roman times. Okay? Darkly. Our lenses are dirty, is what he's saying. But then, after death, resurrection, we shall see face to face, that is, we won't need glasses anymore. A little interesting side note. The Harry Potter novels, the seventh Harry Potter novel, when Harry wakes up towards the end of the book in the chapter King's Cross, after he's quote-unquote been killed, there's a couple interesting things about Harry. One, he doesn't have any glasses, and he sees perfectly. From the beginning of the story to that point, you take his glasses off, he's blind as a bat. He can't see. He wakes up there, he doesn't have the glasses, and he sees fine. He also doesn't have a scar on his forehead anymore. Yeah, it's very biblically resurrection y, you know, kind of language. Okay? So the veil symbolically is telling us what? He sees all the time, darkly. So it's kind of making that biblical idea really present to him. It, it's putting it in the forefront of his mind. Okay. So he goes on. No mortal, no mortal eye will see it withdrawn. Mortal, human, fleshly. Okay. Mortal, however, I said human fleshly, isn't only human. Like if he had a pet cat. Nope, cat would never, you know, he wouldn't flesh a cat and go, you know, where's daddy? You know, nope. Okay, what else? 
This dismal shade, dismal. If something is described as dismal, today is not a dismal day. Today is a bright, sunny, beautiful day. If you lived in the panhandle of Florida yesterday, it would be a dismal day. Okay? And waking up today, even with the sunshine, it would be a pretty dismal day. Why? Because there's just utter destruction everywhere. So dismal literally, however, means that there is a shadow cast over it. So this dismal shade, this shadow, shadow, must separate me from the world. What's the world? Everybody out there. Even you, Elizabeth. Okay, They're not married yet, but they are engaged. He's telling her, whenever the last time was you saw my face, that was the last time you saw my face. What grievous affliction hath befallen you? What does that mean? Are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? Could be that. What else could it be? Are you sick? Okay. That you should thus darken your eyes forever. If it be a sign of mourning. Notice, if implies what? It might not be. Okay. Might be a sign of mourning. Might not be. I, perhaps like most other mortals, have sorrows dark enough to be typified by a black veil. If it is a sign of mourning, then guess what? Pretty much everybody has reason to wear a black veil. They have sorrows. Not necessarily death of a loved one, but other kinds of sorrows. Personal failings, you know, kind of a thing. She says, yeah, but what if the world will not believe that it is the type of an innocent sorrow? That it is an indicator of some kind of deep sorrow that is innocent. What does she mean, innocent? Well, what's the opposite of innocent? Guilty. Put guilty in kind of biblical language. The word I wrote up on the board the other day over here for the translation of hamartia, sin. Okay? Okay. She says, what if everybody thinks it's because of sorrow from some sin? What were we told his first sermon was about the day he put on that veil? Secret sin. Trying to hide something from people. Beloved and respected as you are, there may be whispers. There already have been whispers. There were people whispering as he made his way to church. And then when he left, they were still whispering. That you hide your face under the consciousness of secret sin. In other words, you can't show everybody your face because you're continually blushing because of shame. For the sake of your holy office. What's his holy office? Preacher, local pastor, small town, just one. Okay? Do away this again. That is, you can't let people think that you've got some hoarded up secret sin. Because, I mean, if it's a pastor, is like this. And what about everybody else? If I hide my face for sorrow, he says, there is cause enough. And if I cover it for secret sin, what mortal might not do the same? If I am covering it for secret sin, how does he retort? Then everybody else should too. This is kind of a rephrasing, a, a, a casting in a different form, what happens when Christ has the woman caught in adultery brought before him. Caught in 
in the act. So she's pulled out of maybe some married guy's bed. Okay? They bring her to him. They throw her on the ground in front of him. And they say, what should we do to her? Because what does the Old Testament law say? Get a bunch of rocks and stone her. Okay? And Christ just kind of sits there and he leans down. And he writes with his finger in the sand. And the Bible never tells us what he writes with his finger in the sand. Like, get away, you bunch of hypocrites or you damn fools or, you know. Who do you think I am? We're never told. What does it say? He has no sin, cast the first stone. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And what does that do to all the bigots picking up rocks and stuff? We're just ready to bash the brains in. They're like, damn it. <laughs> okay. Look at what he says. If this covers secret sin, let him who is without sin not put one on. Everybody else, line up. And we're told, we get this longest paragraph. And with this gentle but unconquerable obstinacy did he resist all her entreaties. That all her entreaties implies she doesn't give up after what he just said. She, she keeps going. She keeps pushing. And he gently pushes back. At length, Elizabeth sat silent. For a few moments, she appeared lost in thought, considering, probably, what new methods might be tried. In other words, none of these worked. Maybe there's another way to get at them. To withdraw her lover from so dark a fantasy, which, if it had no other meaning, was perhaps a symptom of mental Though of a firmer character than his own, the tears rolled down her cheeks. Notice, she had a firmer character than his. That means he was more prone to crying than she was. Right? But in an instant, as it were, a new feeling took the place of sorrow. Her eyes were fixed insensibly on the black veil. Insensibly. It's like she's looking at it, but she's not really. Her, her mind is elsewhere. When, like a sudden twilight in the air, its terrors fell around her. Its terrors fell around her. So here's Elizabeth. Here's Parson Hooper. He's wearing his veil. And it's like all of a sudden, the veil goes around her. And notice it's terrible. It's terrors. And we're told she rose and stood trembling. And he says, Oh, you did it, don't you? Now you understand. And do you feel it then at last? She makes no reply, covers her eyes, turns to leave. Notice, covers her eyes. Why? She can't bear to see this. Okay? Let's pause for a moment before he goes to her. And let's go back to one of these Old Testament types that I mentioned. Do any of them wear a veil? Which one? Uh, Moses. When? When he goes up, it's not the mountains tall, but he goes up on the mountain in a meeting with God and comes back and his face is shining. When he comes down from Mount Sinai, after being up there for 40 days and 40 nights, okay, and he comes down carrying what? Ten Commandments, okay? And his face shines. It's not like somebody's, you know, walking with the spotlight on him, keeping him lit up. It shines from within. And it shines so much that the people are like, so he has to put a veil on over his face. <clears throat> Have patience with me, Elizabeth. Do not desert me, though this veil must be between us here on earth. Be mine, and hereafter there shall be no veil over my face, no darkness between our souls. Well, hereafter. That is modern language. In the hereafter. 
When we are dead, there won't be a veil over my face, and there will be no darkness between our souls. What does he mean by darkness between our souls? Go back to the passage of St. Paul in one of the Corinthians. We shall know as we are known. We shall see God face to face. And the implication is, or at least what an awful lot of writers have said, is, and we shall know each other perfectly. We will be the proverbial open book to each other. All right? That's what he means. Bear with me now. Be patient now here on earth. And after, he says, we'll be completely open to one another. It is but a mortal veil. It is not for eternity. Okay? Notice the different kind of meanings for veil here. Literal, piece of cloth, darkness, obscurity, flesh, body, death, mortality. Oh, you know how lonely, you know not how lonely I am and how frightened to be alone behind my black veil. What else can the be alone behind my black veil mean? I talked the other day about you know, alienation and isolation, which, by the way, there have been a couple of studies done in the last couple of years that have shown with the rise and advent of social media, more and more people, especially the longer they spend each day on social media, suffer from these two things. Your generation, these studies are, are saying, is going to wacko because of people constantly being on their phones, okay, and not actually interacting with other people. So, you do not know how lonely I am and how frightened to be alone behind my black veil. What's this black veil? It's not this. It's not the literal veil. The literal veil is merely a symbol of what? A deeper veil. A deeper kind of break between himself and other people. Do not leave me in this miserable obscurity forever. Let me see your face once, she said. Just once. Never. Sayonara. <laughs> and she leaves. And from that time, nobody tries to remove his veil again. Okay? People stay away from him. Little children who used to go up to him as he'd walk around the city or the town now flee from him like he's a monster. Okay? But... Like the Energizer bunny, bunny, he just goes on. He keeps living. He gets old. People come from far and wide to hear his sermons. And page 397, you know, Elizabeth dies. 397, we have him on his deathbed. And this is where we actually left off last week, or like the other time. And the minister of Westbury comes up to him, the Reverend Clark, and says, the moment of your release is at hand. Are you ready for the lifting of the veil that shuts in time from eternity? Okay. So there the veil is death, or life, depending on how you want to look at that, glass half full, etc. Father Hooper replies merely by a feeble motion of his head. He can barely nod. And then he says, Yay, my soul hath a patient weariness until that veil 
be lifted. My soul has a patient weariness. It's endured long. It's weary. It's tired. He wants to die. All right? And so the reverend says, and is it fitting that a man, excuse me, that a man so given to prayer, such a blameless example, other than the little weird veil thing, holy indeed in thought, is it fitting that a father in the church should leave a shadow on his memory? Remove the shadow, show us your face. And he reaches down to pull up the veil. You know, you've all seen movies, TV shows, etc., where somebody has to go to a morgue to identify the body and what happens every time. They have to pull the veil back to reveal, to show what's there. He wants to pull the veil back to do the same thing. And venerable Father Hooper says, never on earth, never. Now the minister, who is affrighted, notice, he's scared. Dark old man. That's, that's not the language of veneration. That's not, oh, you're a great prayer warrior, you know, like, all that kind of stuff. With what horrible crime upon your soul are you now passing to the judgment? Notice what the preacher assumes. You got something to hide. You dirty, rotten SOB. And Father Hooper, breath heaving, rattling in his throat. By the way, that's a symbol. It's the death rattle. He's getting ready to kick the bucket. Raises himself up in bed and gives his last little mini sermon. Why do you tremble at me alone? He says, turning his face around the circle of pale spectators. Okay? In other words, he turns and looks at each one of them. Notice they're pale. Why? Partially because of the veil, but partially because, you know, their the blood has left their face because of their fear, their fright. Tremble also at each other. What he means here is look at each other and tremble. Have men avoided me and women shown no pity and children screamed and fled only for my black veil? No, come on, that's, that's not the reason. You know that's not the reason. What but the mystery which it obscurely typifies has made this piece of crepe so awful. Remember the other day I said a mystery is something that cannot be rationally or logically explained. So what but the thing that cannot be rationally or logically explained that this veil typifies, points to, okay, has made this piece of crepe so awful. He's saying the thing that this piece of crepe points to, that's what scared the hell out of everybody. That's what's made men shun me, women, how do you put it, shown no pity, and children run kicking and screaming away from me. When the friend shows his inmost heart to his friend, okay, so what does that mean? When a friend shows his inmost heart to his friend, or a friend to her friend, you know, he's not being sexist. How often do you, this is rhetorical, don't answer. How often do you show your inmost heart, the inner core of your being, to a friend or a family member or a loved one? Or in my case, a wife that I've been married to for years. 33 years, right? When the friend shows his inmost heart to his friend, Semicolon. You're supposed to apply the when. When the lover shows his, 
his inmost heart to his best beloved, semicolon. When the man, when man does not vainly shrink from the eye of his creator, loathsomely treasuring up the secret of his sin, when those three things are not done, in other words, when the friend does show his inmost heart to his friend, when the lover does show his inmost heart to his beloved, and when the worst vilest sinner doesn't try to hide from God, then do what? Then deem me a monster. Why? For the symbol beneath which I have lived and died. I look around me and lo, on every visage a black veil. <coughs> and he croaks. Notice, while his auditors shrank from one another in mutual affright. Father Hooper fell back and died. Why do they fall from... It doesn't mean they're falling on the ground. It means they're backing up from each other. Like. Okay? Like. Similar to. They discover the person next to me has the plague. What's the plague? This hiding. It's like he delivers the words and they suddenly look at each other and what, do, what does each of them see? A black veil. This person that I thought I knew totally blank to me. So, what's the veil? What's the symbolism of the veil? What is Hawthorne getting at? I'll let you answer that. Let's jump to, I know they're out of order in the book. Let's jump to um, William Faulkner's Barn Burning, which is in chapter 13, I guess. I don't know if that's what that's called or not. Uh, it starts on page 480. And I don't know. I don't know why they did these in this order, because Barn Burning was written in 1939, and Flannery O'Connor's Good Man is Hard to Find was written in 1953, right? So they should have put, my thinking at least, they should have put Faulkner first. A little bit of, very, very little bit of background about Faulkner. You've got the little introduction. Um, to him. Famous novelist, won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950. He won it long after he'd really been writing anything good. I mean, it was kind of, it wasn't a posthumous because he didn't die until 1962. But he'd written all of his best novels. Oh, let's see, 1950. 30 to 10 years before. So it's like 1920 to about 1940 or so, okay? In his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, I don't think that's in here. He says that one of his purposes for writing is to get at the heart of humanity, to, to express what is kind of essential to all of us. But he also said that he was a novelist and not a poet for the simple reason that the poet says the most in the least number of words. And he kind of implies by that the novelist says the least in the most number of words. Okay? So Barn Burning. None of his books, I should, I should add, none of his books were... Um, would have been what we would call today New York Times bestsellers. And he always wanted them to be. He wanted to write, you know, the, the real page turners. And he tried his hand at one. It involved rape and, you know, sorority girls from Ole Miss and 
weird stuff, okay? Um, and he, it just didn't work. He also wanted to try his hand as a screenwriter. We wanted to make it big in Hollywood. He, he couldn't because he didn't write the kind of stuff that made great Hollywood films. He did have one screenplay, Intruder in the Dust, but it wasn't a great film. So we have Barn Burning. And with Barn Burning, hold on, I've got to make sure I write this, spell this right. With Barn Burning, you get It's something like that. You get the introduction to Yakna Patafa County in Mississippi. It's a made-up county. His novels are primarily set in Mississippi, Old South, either just before the Civil War, all the way up to up to about 1920. Many of them late 19th century, just after the Civil War to right around 1900. Okay. This short story is not too long after the Civil War, 20, 30 years. Okay. And it features a character named Abner Snopes. Okay. Snopes is one of the families that figures in almost all of his novels. That is, writing primarily about characters in this county He's got a couple of significant families, okay? Snopes is one of them. And you see the kind of the genealogical development of, these, of this family. So here we have Abner Snopes. And just listen to the, the first paragraph here. Because I'm going to ask a couple of questions after. The store in which the Justice of the Peace is court was sitting, smelled of cheese. The boy, now look at this next sentence, how long it is. The boy, crouched on his nail keg at the back of the crowded room, knew he smelled cheese and more. From where he sat, he could see the ranked shelves close packed with the solid, squat, dynamic shapes of tin cans whose labels, his stomach red, not from the lettering, which meant nothing to his mind, but from the scarlet devils and the silver curve of fish. This, the cheese, which he knew he smelled, <clears throat> and the hermetic meat, which his intestines believed he smelled, coming in intermittent gusts, momentary and brief, between the other common, constant one. The smell and just, the smell and sense, just a little of fear, because mostly of despair and grief, the old fierce pull of blood. Look how long that sentence. That is a quintessential Faulknerian sentence. 100, 120, 130 words. Okay. So, without reading anything else in that paragraph, what do we know about the boy? He's hungry. How do we know he's hungry? Stomach read the labels. Why did his stomach read them and not his eyes? And? His primary focus was about using his stomach to best focus on the eyes. Okay. Why else? Because the labels didn't make any sense to his mind, we were told. Okay? Not from the lettering, which meant nothing to his mind. He can't read. Notice what the so-called smells, because they're not really smells, it's his mind sees the silver fish, it's like tuna fish, on the can, and it reminds him he's hungry. That those smells come in with intermittent gusts, momentary and brief, between the other constant one. 
The other constant, what? The smell and sense just a little of fear because mostly of despair and grief and the old fierce toll of blood. This is the theme Faulkner loves to, to write about. Okay? He could not see the table where the justice sat, before which his father and his father's enemy, and then we get parentheses. And the parentheses is telling us, is taking us inside the boy's mind. Okay? So we have an example here of editorial omniscience. The editor, the voice, is letting us know what the boy thinks, not by what the boy says. What does the boy think? Our enemy. He thought in that despair. Ourn, which the n imply. Ourn. Kids are what? He's a redneck. He's a hick. Okay? Our, mine and his and both. He's my father. So, the boy's father and his enemy. Notice what's going on in this general story. What's the setting? It's a trial. Justice of the peace. His father is one of the people. We don't know if his father is defendant or prosecutor. But what proof have you, Mr. Harris? And Mr. Harris comes in and says, I told you the hog got into my corn. I caught it up, sent it back to him. He had no fence that would hold it. Okay. So when he came to get it, I gave him enough wire to patch up his pen. The hog got out again. He says, I told him he could have the hog back if he gave me a dollar pound fee. That is kind of a kennel fee. That evening, a nigger came with the dollar, got the hog. He was a strange nigger. He said, he said to tell you wood and hay can burn. I said, what? Is that what he said to you? The nigger said, wood and hay can burn. That night, my barn burned. Got the stock out, but I lost the barn. There's the title of the short story, right? Barn burning. Where's the nigger? Have you got him? He was a strange nigger. I don't tell you. I don't know what became of him. Why doesn't he know what became of him? This is after slavery. This is after the Civil War. Okay? So the Justice of the Peace says, but that's not proof. In other words... If he could come and testify, that would be proof. But he's not there. She says, okay, get that boy up here, Mr. Harris. This is the guy whose hog was stolen. Excuse me. This is the guy who impounded the hog and then had his barn burned. Get that boy up here. He knows. And they thought, no, the you got him, the little one. The boy... Excuse me, and crouching, small for his age, small and wiry like his father, and patched and faded jeans, even too small for him. What does that tell us? They're poor. His clothes are too small. With straight, uncombed, brown hair, eyes gray, wild, the storm's cut, he saw the men between himself and the table, they part like the Red Sea. They're expecting him to walk up and do what? Testify against his father. And the boy goes up, and what does he think? He aims for me to lie, he thought. Again, with that frantic, frantic grief and despair. What's the despair? Of the old fierce bull of blood. Who's the he that he refers to? Daddy. Daddy aims for me to lie. And I will have to do him. What's your name, boy? Colonel Sartoris Snopes. And uh, Colonel Sartoris was a famous, within Faulkner's mythology, Civil War Colonel. Okay? So you, may, you merely mention the name, and it's like, oh, thank you, Jesus. You know. <laughs> and the just, eh? Hey, Talk louder. Colonel Sartoris, I reckon anybody named for Colonel Sartoris in this country 
Can him if I tell the truth. Can him. And the boy thinks, enemy! En Who's the enemy? The boy's thinking the judge. He could not see that the justice's face was kindly, nor discern that his voice was troubled when he spoke to the man named Harris. Do you want me to question this boy? You want, you honestly, seriously, you want me to stand this boy up and make him speak against his father? No, said Harris. Why do you think not? What do you think Harris might realize? Okay, what else? Yeah, the, the father definitely has some anger issues, right? I mean, he burned down a barn because he had to pay a dollar a pound fee. Okay. No. Justice and peace. This case is closed. Can't find against you, Snopes, but I can give you advice. Leave this county, country, and don't come back. His father, I aim to. I don't figure to stay in a country among people who, and then he says something that can't be printed. That'll do. Take your way and get out of this country before dark. Case dismissed. Okay? So they get ready to leave. And as the boy follows his father and older brother out, another boy from the town says, Burn, burner. And the boy, whose name we don't know yet, does what? I mean, we know it's Colonel Sartoris. Sardi, as his, as he's nicknamed, does what? He just launches full into this kid. Okay? Why? He's defending his father. All right? So they go to the wagon. Sardi's beaten up. His mother says he's hurt. Got to get some water and wash this. He tells her, get back in that wagon. Okay? And Sardi thinks, bottom of 481, as they get ready to leave town forever, he thought. Maybe he's done satisfied now, now that he has stopping himself. Why does he stop himself? And what does he stop himself from saying? Now that he has what? Burn the barn. He can't admit to himself what his father is. Notice, maybe he will stop now. The now tells us. Is this the first time Abner's burned a barn? Nope. Okay. So, they go on. They camp that night by a grove of oaks and beeches. Father builds a fire. How's he build it? What's he build it of? He takes wood from a fence. Okay, like a split log fence, takes a couple of logs off, builds a fire. Does he build a nice big roaring fire to keep them warm? It's late spring, early summer, so temperatures can still get down in the 40s at night. We're pretty clear they probably don't have, you know, parkas and such. They don't have heavy clothing. No, he builds a little teeny tiny fire. Okay? And the father says, bottom of 482, if you were fixing to tell them, you would have told them. He didn't answer. His father struck him with the flat of his hand on the side of the head. Now, is the flat of the hand the palm, or is it the back side? And we're told how he struck him. Hard, but without heat. Exactly as he had struck the two mules at the store. Exactly as he would strike either of them with any stick in order to kill a horse fly. Without heat or anger. Why without heat or anger? Just a reaction. Yeah, kind of. It's just discipline. What is he saving his heat and anger for? Bar. I mean, that's, if he's going to build a fire, it's going to be a doozy, you know. So, he says to him, you're getting to be a man. 
somewhere in here we're told Sardi is it's on the next page. Ten years old, twelve years old. Top of 43. Yeah, 10 years old. You're getting to be a man. At 10 years old. You got to learn. You got to learn to stick to your own blood. Or you ain't going to have any blood to stick to you. Do you think either of them, sorry, I lived in Mississippi for four years and that exit comes out. Do you think either of them, any man there this morning would, do you know all they wanted was a chance to get at me because they knew I had them beat? Really? He had them beat. How? Because he burned the barn and they couldn't prove it. Yeah, but who's leaving? Who got kicked out of town? Don't you know all they wanted was a chance to get at me because they knew I had them beat? If I had said, the boy thinks, 20 years later, notice the jump forward in time. Later, 20 years later, he was to tell himself, this is the boy. If I had said they wanted only truth, justice, he would have hit me again. But now he said nothing. His father said, answer me. Yes. All right, get on to bed now. So the next morning, they're there, wherever there is. Paintless, two-room house, identical, almost with the dozen others. It had stopped before, even in the boy's 10 years. He's 10 years old. They've moved a dozen times in that period of time. His brother is older than he is. And I think the sisters are maybe between the brother's age and Sardi's age. We don't know how many times they moved before Sardi was. But if this is any indication, they've probably moved about once every 10, 11 months or once every season. Not every season, fall, winter, spring, summer, but once every planting, harvesting season, once a year. Okay? And so we hear talk, you know, with the sisters and such. And Abner tells the boy, come with me. Paragraph 35. Me? You. The mother says, Abner, I reckon I'll have a word with the man that aims to begin tomorrow owning me body and soul for the next eight months. So what kind of employment does Abner have? Why will this person own him, body and soul, for, for eight months? Keep going. What kind of work do people have who didn't own property after the second, excuse me, after the Civil War that involved planting, weeding, harvesting? That was called sharecropping. sharecropping. Yeah. Sharecroppers. So what does that mean, sharecropping? Take this room, and this room is 40 acres. Okay? You agree for a certain amount of time to plant, maintain, harvest all of that 40 acres. And 35 of that 40 acres, the product of that, goes to the person whose land it is. You get to keep five. That might be one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is... You've got to provide for me X number of bushels of corn. Whatever number of bushels of corn beyond that that the land produces, that's what you're going to keep for yourself. So it's in your best interest to make sure that land is really productive. Okay? All right, we'll stop there. We'll finish this um, Wednesday and start... Uh, a good man is hard to find. Plan on a quiz on Wednesday over the, the terms for fiction and um, these two short stories. Ministers Blackville and Barnbury.
Elizabeth like got the recognition. You talked about that during Hamlet, right? 